Hi, I'm Sue Lynch, and today I'm going to speak about evidence for the early life gut microbiome and promoting allergic inflammation and strategies for manipulating microbes in the very early life gut microbiome to prevent disease development. By way of disclosure, I am a co-founder, a board member, and a consultant for Shield the Therapeutics Incorporated. And to provide an overview for what we'll cover today, I will first speak about the gut microbiome and its development across our spatial and temporal gradients, the role of the early life gut microbiome in allergic inflammation, and gut microbiome manipulation to prevent allergic inflammation development. So, the field of human microbiome research has revealed to us over the last 15 years or so that humans are in fact superorganisms. We're colonized inside and out by a diverse community of microbes whose bioactive molecules shape host cellular functions and uh, phenotypes. And as the field has developed over the last several years, an increasing array of chronic diseases have been associated with perturbations to the human microbiome. For example, dermatological um, conditions are associated with alterations in skin microbiomes and in the gut alterations and perturbations to the types and activities of microbes at that site are associated with diseases such as obesity and inflammatory bowel disease. But what has become increasingly evident with expansion of studies in this field is that the gut microbiome and its products also play a role in a number of diseases that manifest at distinct sites. For example, depression and autism spectrum disorder, as well as cardiovascular disease and asthma. And so that has led many of us in the field to really focus on the gut microbiome and its functions as playing key roles in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases. In a study performed some years ago and published in Nature Biotechnology, which assessed the suite of microbial genes found in fecal microbiomes of just over 1,200 adult participants from Asia, Europe, and the United States, identified almost 10 million unique microbial genes in these gut microbiomes, expanding the repertoire of functional genes that are present in the human host and, and influencing how the human host behaves and functions. Moreover, additional studies have indicated that in Western nations, uh, US populations, for example, have lost quite a range of bacterial species within the gut microbiome. This is a study performed by Yatsenenko and colleagues where they, in, they examined United States populations and those of developing nations, populations of Malawian and Amerindians. And what was clear was that in the United States, the number of types of bacterial um, taxa that were detected in US populations was significantly lower than those in populations in developing countries. Consistent with this observation, the authors also noted that the types of microbes and genes they encode present in these gut microbiomes were clearly influenced by the pronounced dietary influences of these populations. For example, in the Malawian and the Amerindian populations, their gut microbiomes were enriched for alpha amylases, enzymes necessary to metabolize plant polysaccharides. In contrast, in US populations, they, these gut microbiomes were enriched for microbial genes involved in the metabolism of simple sugars, characteristic of processed foods. And so clearly, diet plays a large role in shaping and uh, selecting for specific microbiome genetic content. Moreover, what has become apparent in the field is that the microbiome in the gut produces a very large number and diversity of bioactive metabolites. This has been shown clearly in cases of autism spectrum disorder and cardiovascular disease, where microbial derived molecules produced in the gut influence neurological behavior or cardiovascular health. And so that has led us to ask whether this is also true um, of allergic inflammation and whether microbes and their products in the gut microbiome may influence response to allergens encountered in ingested food. 
And the last piece to consider is that the gut microbiome is not static, but rather it develops very rapidly over the first several years of life and continues to be shaped by environmental exposures such as pharmaceuticals, diet, and antimicrobials, etc. But it's really over the first three years of life that there's this profound period of microbiological development that occurs in lockstep with immune training or imprinting and physiological development of the human host. And so this observation has led us to ask whether early life gut microbiomes actually relate to allergic sensitization. And in our case, we're also interested in asthma development much later in childhood. And the first study that allowed us to address this hypothesis was in collaboration with Chris Johnson and Dennis Ownby at Henry Ford Hospital, who direct the Wheels birth cohort. This is a racially and socioeconomically diverse birth cohort in the Detroit greater metropolitan area. And within the birth cohort, we examined a subset of 130 one month old fecal samples from babies in the Wheels birth cohort. We examined their bacterial 16S composition and their fungal uh, composition based on ITS2 biomarker sequencing. And because this was a birth cohort, we had defined outcomes of atopy at two years of age and asthma at four years of age. We used an agnostic uh, modeling tool to determine whether there were distinct gut microbiome structures shaped by a range of environmental exposures that were evident in these babies at one month of age. We identified three shown here as NGM one, two, and three. And I'm just showing here on the right, principal components analysis. How we read these plots is each spot represents a profile of bacteria in the gut microbiome of each baby in this cohort. And the distance between a single spot and all other spots on this plot tells you how similar these bacterial community profiles are in these participants, with shorter distances indicating more similar bacterial composition. And so you can clearly see that NGM1, NGM2, and NGM3 are significantly different in their composition. And this accounts for about 9% of the variance we see in microbiomes across this cohort of 130 babies. Linking these early life gut microbiomes to subsequent clinical outcomes in childhood, we find that the, one of these microbiomes, NGM3, was found detected in babies who were at significantly higher risk of subsequent atopy development at two years and asthma development at four years of age. This gut microbiome was characterized by a range of bacterial depletions, including key immunomodulatory organisms such as Acromancia and Fecalibacterium, enrichment of allergenic fungi such as Candida and Rhodotorula, and with 16S based predictions of functions, we determined that this high risk gut microbiome was functionally deficient and it lacked a whole range of metabolic pathways, microbial metabolic pathways. This prompted us to perform on targeted mass spectrometry to examine the profiles of molecules produced by this gut microbiome. And in doing so and performing comparative analyses, we determined that this high risk gut microbiome produced a very distinct profile of metabolic products. And so these observations led us to hypothesize that the products of this high risk perturbed neonatal gut microbiome uh, three actually promote immune dysfunction associated with allergic sensitization. We know with the advent of the immunometabolism field that substrates available for metabolism by host immune cells in large part dictate their effector phenotype. And so we considered that microbial products produced in early life by the perturbed gut microbiome may actually shape immune function in these infants. And so to do this, we developed a novel in vitro assay that involved dendritic cells and naive T cells purified autologously from healthy adult donors. The dendritic cells are then incubated with cell-free products of either the low-risk NGM1 or the high-risk NGM3 infant fecal material. They are incubated, washed, and then co-incubated and cultured with naive T cells prior to flow analysis to examine TH1 to 17 and T regulatory cell responses. 
And of course, we're particularly interested in Th2 and Treg responses in the context of this study because we're interested in allergic inflammation. And what we found was that consistently, the NGM3 high-risk fecal microbiome extracts induced Th2 cells, induced their production of IL-4, and reduced regulatory T cell populations in vitro. In essence, the cell-free products of the perturbed high-risk gut microbiome could recapitulate the immune dysfunction that's cardinal to allergic inflammation in these babies, which they develop later in childhood suggesting that early life microbiomes and their products may promote subclinical allergic inflammation prior to clinical diagnosis of disease. We wanted to determine which molecules within this metabolic profile may actually be responsible for this T-cell effector phenotype that we'd observed in vitro. And using comparative analysis of our metabolomic data, we'd identified 12,13-dihome and oxylipin as uh, highly enriched in the fecal microbiome of one-month-old babies who went on to develop allergy and asthma at high frequency. We use the same dendritic cell T cell assay, and this is work that was led by Sophia Levin in our group, and showed that concentrations of this lipid are highly enriched in these high risk babies, and that in a dose dependent uh, manner, increasing concentrations of 1213 dihome decreases the frequency of regulatory T cells and their capacity to produce anti inflammatory IL 10, essentially recapitulating the T reg phenotype we'd observed with fecal extracts from NGM3 babies. Sophie went on to demonstrate that intraperitoneal injection of this lipid into mice prior to airway allergic sensitization with cockroach antigen resulted in significantly enhanced allergic inflammation in the airways around the bronchioles and the blood vessels of these animals. And this was consistent with a reduced capacity to induce regulatory T cell T-cell populations in the airways of these animals and also was consistent with increased concentrations of circulating IgE in these animals. So this confirmed that this single oxylipin isolated from the gut microbiome of these high-risk babies has the capacity to promote allergic inflammation and exacerbate it in the airways suggesting that elevated concentrations of this oxylipin in the neonatal gut may promote allergic inflammation through its capacity to reduce regulatory T-cell frequency and activity. To move forward with this, Sophie went on to show that the copy number of bacterial genes responsible for producing this lipid in the neonatal gut microbiome are the concentration of the lipids itself significantly related to the odds ratio of developing allergy or asthma later in childhood. And this was also found to be true in an independent birth cohort centered in the San Francisco Bay Area. So in summary, these data indicate that early life gut microbiome structures relate to atopic disease development and that specific microbial risk genes can be identified that mediate or influence risk of developing asthma and allergies much later in childhood. And that by using a confluence of approaches, we can identify specific microbial derived molecular mechanisms of early life immune dysfunction that precede childhood disease development. And as we think about how the microbiome develops, we think of it as an ecosystem developing. And what we know from ecological theory is that the primary colonizers are the first species into a pristine ecosystem, frequently dictate the pace and trajectory of ecosystem development and species accumulation over time. And so we've considered that this framework also applies to human microbiome development and that distinct gut microbiomes, as we've seen in the wheel study in very early life, may relate to distinct trajectories of microbiome development and therefore immune training in very early life that precedes allergy and asthma development years later in childhood. And so the next question we addressed is whether the gut microbiome can be reprogrammed in early life to alter allergic inflammatory responses. As a basis for this study, we collaborated with Michael Cabana and Julia Durock in my own group. 
And Michael had the trial of infant uh, probiotic supplementation ongoing in which high risk for asthma infants based on having at least one parent with diagnosed asthma. High risk infants were supplemented daily with a commercially available probiotic lactobacillus species, lactobacillus rhamnosus GG or placebo. In parallel, he had a cohort of healthy control infants, and these babies were all sampled, birth one, three, six, nine, and 12 months of age. Supplementation occurred for the first six months of life in the high-risk infants on a daily basis, and uh, stool samples were collected, which underwent 16S ribosomal RNA analysis and untargeted metabolomic analysis in a subset of these samples. What we found was that the microbiome perturbation that we'd observed in the wheels cohort at one month of age is actually evident at birth in high risk for asthma infants. Here again, I'm showing a principal components analysis plot with high risk placebo supplemented babies in red and healthy controls in green. And you can clearly see a separation between the two groups. And this is highly significant. Again, consistent with our ecological theory framework, these high-risk babies really develop a different trajectory of gut microbiome development. It appears delayed in terms of its diversification compared to that of healthy control babies. But critically, introduction of a lactobacillus species on a daily basis to these high-risk babies significantly alters the slope of their bacterial diversification over the first year of life so that it is no longer significantly different from that of the healthy control babies. While those babies who are at high risk who received the placebo have a significantly different trajectory of microbiome development over this period. At six months of age, the cell-free products of the high-risk lactobacillus supplemented babies actually significantly induce, induce more regulatory T cells in our dendritic cell um, T cell assay and move, trend towards significant in, increases in IL-10 production, suggesting that manipulation of the gut microbiome in these babies is safe. There was no adverse events reported and that in doing so, we can actually induce the capacity to induce more regulatory T cells by the products of these microbiomes that have been manipulated, suggesting that this may represent a strategy for manipulating the microbiome in early life to prevent disease development. And so we've leveraged data from that trial as we've thought about the cocktail of organisms that must be required to manipulate and re-engineer the early life gut microbiome so that it produces a whole range of molecules that appropriately train immune function and ultimately tolerance in these high-risk babies. And so leveraging longitudinal data from the TIPS trial, we predicted the functions that were depleted in high-risk babies over the entire first year of life and then determined the minimal set of microbes in the very early life gut microbiome that was necessary to encode the broadest suite of these functional traits that were depleted in high-risk babies. The concept here is that these organisms are introduced at birth and that they reprogram microbiome development and function they reprogram metabolic productivity in, of the gut microbiome, and in doing so, program immune maturation and tolerance towards that of a healthy microbiome. And just some preclinical mouse study that we developed for this cocktail or biotherapeutic intervention. This is, again is a murine study of airway allergic inflammation, and you can clearly see compared to the controls here where cockroach antigen sensitization occurred, that those animals who received oral supplementation with the biotherapeutic intervention or the microbial cocktail have pristine airways. And that a live, metabolically active microbial cocktail is necessary to promote protection against allergic inflammation is indicated by this panel here in which we used heat-killed bacterial therapeutic. What we've seen from this study is that this microbial cocktail influences the gut microbiome composition and also its metabolic output. It has systemic effects on CD4 populations, not just in the lungs, but also in the spleen. 
and it systemically impacts macrophage populations, both in the mesenteric lymph nodes, the spleen, and the lung, promoting these populations and ultimately manifesting as improved airway physiology in the airways of these animals. And so this biotherapeutic has been licensed by Shilfa Therapeutics Incorporated, which I mentioned at the top of the talk, and is now in phase 1b, phase 2 clinical trial in neonates. And so to summarize, what I have relayed today is that the early life gut microbiome is distinct and it function, functionally contributes to allergic inflammation in, uh, in uh, those at high risk of allergy development. That specific microbial derived bioactive molecules promote allergic inflammation and that the gut microbiome can be safely manipulated in early life but that we need to move towards cocktails of organisms that reinstate depleted microbial functions in those at heightened risk for disease development. And that in rationally designing such biotherapeutics, our hope is that we will develop novel approaches to combat allergic disease development. I'd like to acknowledge the many people who've contributed to this work, particularly those at UCSF, Homer Boucher, Michael Cabana, Kay Fujimura, Julia Durek, Sophia Levin, those at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab who have helped us with shotgun metagenomic sequencing, Shield of Therapeutics, which is led by Nicole Kimes and Ricardo Valadares, two of my previous postdocs who worked on these preclinical studies in mice of the biotherapeutic, and of course, our colleagues and collaborators at Henry Ford Hospital, and in particular, Chris Johnson and Dennis Ownby for access to their birth cohort and, and all of their knowledge. Thank you.